Thank you. Um, well, thanks, Jim, and the organizing team uh, for the invitation uh, to be part of this um, workshop for the next two days. Um, so I'm Michael Sinatra, and on behalf of the five authors listed uh, on these slides, I want to tell you a little bit about our project um, based in Quebec. And Quebec, I'm very proud to say, has been quite a pioneer in North America in the field of digital humanities with you know, a series of various achievements, but in particular in critical publishing. And you've all heard and used Voyant tool that my colleague Stéphane Sinclair had developed um, before he passed um, as one of the you know, very you know, used uh, uh, Protocol. Sorry, I'm feeling a bit jet lagged today. Uh, the many researchers that's affiliated in the discipline uh, for us uh, you know, really came together about a decade ago when uh, this one, um, we started uh, the Groupe de Recherche sur les Editions Critiques en Contexte Numérique, bringing together people from different disciplinary backgrounds information school, religious studies, um, English, um, design, uh, philosophy, and communication. Um, and Italian studies, uh, all working uh, together to sort of uh, receive funding from the Fonds Québécois Société Culture, so the Quebec funding bodies, uh, in order to federate individual expertise within a team that both enhances the value of individual work, but also forges new collaborations for research project and grant application, and supervising graduate students that we do, you know, um, and share supervisions uh, with them and postdoctoral fellow. Our team is uh, primarily distinguished by the francophone dimension, which makes it unique in Canada in the field of DH, uh, because on the one hand, obviously, the technical specificity of French in terms of epistemological models, but also linguistic and disciplinary and intellectual diversity of our members enables us to offer an alternative to these epistemological models that are primarily found in critical editions. So we really want to tie it to uh, the documentary tradition with its historical basis in that notion of stability, insisting on the fixity or permanence, integrity of content, but also engaging with the way that the web put the emphasis back on flow, on dynamics of exchange, on mutability of content. Thus, between the two classic poles of stability and movement, a redistribution is taking place, and according to the different phases, and, and calling in communication in particular, are always very fond of of engaging with that topic, the document can be a mean of distancing an event for the purpose of proof and memory, but also make it possible for the duration of the stage involved in the construction and access. So today, with the speed of production, as well as automated documentary distribution and recommendation by automated system, the human is no longer always having the time to construct the event as a document but can only visualize a partial representation of it. So how do critical edition engage with that sort of technological change that has profoundly altered our research editing methods? Media has also changed, and the way that we engage with scholarship in different remote and portable devices also you know, restrict physically um, the way that we use notes and other supplementary information. So the, you know, the constraint that you know, we are sort of used to in textual form has been you know, fully you know, transformed. So with this long and distance form of production, we have two temporalities that overlap and our kind of intention throughout these different projects, and Joyce will be mentioning several in particular, we want to really engage with what Mila Dwey has sort of discussed as a kind of digital humanism in a way that you know, the tools transcend the technical aspect but really our own relationship with production of knowledge. So with a change to media, publication method, visibility mechanisms, information accessibility, you know, we have in, for us the idea of trying to rethink a theory of critical edition to implement new research tools that are designed by and for the humanities in direct relation to questions of publishing, dissemination, and counting, text mining, and visual representation along the World Wide Web. Um, the presentation today is tied for, uh, on the one hand with the team that I've, you've got here 
but also with the Social Sciences and Humanities Research uh, Funded, that's a Canadian uh, federal province, uh, level funding that uh, gave us money for the Nouvelle Réflexion sur les éditions critiques en contexte numérique, to complement our work and bring in international partners to you know, and, and practitioners and theorists from four different countries in Europe involve themselves in a whole series of projects. So we've brought in 13 colleagues from America, Germany and France to sort of try to have that international perspective that I sort of touched upon earlier on in my own questions. And this allowed us to sort of think about activities that we made around two main axes. There we go. Um, the first one around new form of knowledge uh, uh, emergence under the direction of Marcello Vitali Rossati, who's a Canada Research Chair in Digital Textuality at the University of Montreal. And this is you know, the, the text that I'm going to be reading up. So this axis looks at how digital technology is emerging as a new support environment that is reconfiguring the way research is produced, shaped, and circulated in scientific communities. We focus here on a critical digital publishing environment and a collaborative corpus building platform. This axis brings together researchers who are developing a theoretical reflections on digital issues and the cultural changes brought about by technologies. In particular, it will examine the impact of digital technology on conceptual processes. How does it change the way we see, conceive, understand the world? How have digital processes transformed our relationship to historical artifact? how we might define a phenomenology of the digital. And this is complemented by a second research axis, uh, um, validation and legitimation of content that uh, uh, by Emmanuel chateau dutier a museum study specialist also at the University of Montréal. And this axis explores the multiplication of sources and the integration of different types of content into research and critical publishing practices. This broadening of sources has opened up new opportunities for the development of research hypotheses, and the axis explores the practice of dissemination and editorialization that have been radically transformed by the semantic web with the many other upheaval in digital communication regimes, such as the Internet of Things, augmented realities. Reflecting on the ways in which content is editorialized is far from being a purely practical issue, but it requires in-depth theoretical works upstream, which must constantly remain in contact with downstream practice. So our new you know, sort of uh, partnership grant currently brings together these uh, wonderful 21 researchers and six partners who stand up for their original thinking. Um, and you can see at the bottom, Ryerson um, University in Ottawa, um, both in Canada, but the University of Trier with my colleague, Christoph Schoch and Tufts University for the Greek anthology. Hi, so um, I'm Joyce Bora, one of the members of the group. Um, so as Michael mentioned, our group involves many partners um, and lots of projects. Um, but despite the variety, I think um, all the projects coalesce in the commitment to process-driven collaborative work and in a desire to rethink the boundaries um, of what critical logicians can do through a combination of theory and praxis. So in the time that we have left, I want to focus on um, some of these projects, starting with those that we have on our website. How do I do the slides? Just the uh, arrow. The, I don't want to push the wrong. Yeah. Oh, it's on the yeah. um, There we go. Okay. Um, starting with um, what we have listed on our website, um, which is non exhaustive, as you can tell by the number of people involved. We do a lot more than that, but I want to start with those um, and then talk about two of the projects in, in a little bit uh, more detail. Um, so the first one, um, the Anthologie Palatine, I'll talk about in detail in a bit. Um, the second one we have there is the Digital Lee Hunt, um, which is led by Michael. Um, this is an online uh, database and anthology devoted to the 19th century writer's critical writings and also an exploration of his reception, um, his interactions, and his networks. Um, the Novin de Cameron is led by Jean-François Vallée. Um, this is an online anthology of short literary texts and visual arts, um, all of which were created during um, and just after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And the point of this project is to use social media and this platform to kind of think about and expand uh, the interactive possibilities of digital uh, publication. Um, the next one there is uh, the Library of Glissant Studies. Uh, this is left, uh, led by Jeanne Gigousseau and Raphael Laroux. 
which focuses on the French Martinique writer um, Edouard Plissin, um, working on a digital anthology of his work um, and also a big focus on uh, the, his critical reception um, and those two very much uh, working together. Um, Revue 2.0, uh, led by Marcello, we already mentioned. Um, this is a, a pilot project that's challenging and rethinking the role of scholarly journals in the humanities and social sciences and helping to accompany journals um, in a transition to the digital realm um, and kind of really theorizing how that can happen. So it's both a theoretical and a, a practical um, project. Um, Stilo, the last one there, also uh, led by Marcello, um, is a text editor uh, for the humanities and social sciences, so it's very much a tool um, that he's creating, um, adapted to today's needs. Um, it's both a tool, um, as I said, and it's also a philosophy of text um, based on the idea that we need to be designing text models that are specifically adapted for writing um, in the humanities. Um, and as I said, there are lots of other projects that aren't um, listed on the website, um, one of which is the Texting Wild project uh, led by Jason Boyd at Toronto Metropolitan University, um, which focusing on Oscar Wilde is also exploring um, computer-assisted methods for analyzing large, large collections um, of life-writing texts. Um, another one is one of my projects, um, which is Shakespeare O slash in Quebec, um, which I'm co-doing with, uh, working on with Jennifer Druin, and I'm going to talk about uh, that one also um, in a couple of minutes. Um, so yeah, so Anthologie Palatine, in the Greek anthology, um, this is a project led by Marcello Vitali Rosati in collaboration with Elisa Bouchard and uh, Christian Rach, all of which, are, all of whom are at uh, Université de Montréal with us. Um, this project aims to provide a critical edition of the Greek anthology. Uh, this is a compilation of Greek epigrammic poetry from the classical to the Byzantine period. So we're talking about more than 4,000 pieces uh, by about 325 different authors written over 16 centuries. Um, the base texts are the Codex uh, Palatinus, which dates to 940, and the Appendix Plodea, which dates to 1301. Um, which are themselves based on earlier manuscript collections, some of which date back to the 4th century BCE, um, which provide all sorts of different compilations and reconfigurations of the epigrams. So this is hugely complicated uh, textual history and makes my head spin just thinking about it. Um, the platform is aiming to offer the most complete edition possible of each one of these epigrams. Um, so each epigram is associated with several types of editable information, um, including all the different versions of the Greek texts from all the different manuscript witnesses, uh, translations into different languages, um, working on as well with alignments of these translations, all sorts of notes, commentaries, uh, information on the authors, um, images of the codex um, and the scolia, so the critical commentary in the manuscripts. Um, keywords, places cited, etc. a lot. The edition isn't meant to compete with the numerous existing uh, editions of the Greek anthology, but rather it's working to suggest an alternative philological approach, continuing the, antholo the anthological project initiated by the first compilers. So the project's very much moving away from a classical, critical, genetic edition, um, really going from the premise that there is no true or original text um, and it highlights the pluralities um, of the textual material because this variety is at the origin of the collective imagination that is uh, the Greek anthology. By definition, an anthology is characterized by the use of several sources and the continuous enrichment um, of that corpus. Which is really interesting is as well with this project is that there's been a recent um, kind of experimentation with AI, um, looking at algorithms to, uh, not to track the variation, but to kind of understand how variation works. So the hypothesis, and maybe Michael could talk about this more, I don't know, um, or we'll have to beam in Marcello. Um, but the hypothesis is, is that if we can figure out an algorithm, algorithm that can describe the textual heterogeneity of the Greek anthology that we can work towards establishing um, like a more formal definition of what variation actually is. 
um, which I think is really neat, and I wish I understood how to do that and more of it, but it's beyond me. Um, so yeah, so my project, um, Shakespeare um, slash in Quebec, um, this is a bilingual open access project dedicating to producing a critical anthology as well as an interactive theater database of the approximately uh, 40 textual uh, dramatic adaptations of Shakespeare's plays uh, written in Quebec from 1960 to the present. I say approximately because the list keeps growing, so I just when you think you've got a handle on it, someone goes ahead and writes another one, which is very inconvenient. Um, most of these plays are written in French, um, two of them are in English, uh, two are bilingual. Um, the bilingual one is editing that was, um, it was, it was a joy, it was a joy. Um, so given the, the long-standing linguistic tensions between French and English in Quebec and the prevalent categorization of England and the Anglosphere generally as an unwanted colonial presence, the repeated turn to Shakespeare by Franco-Quebecois writers may seem surprising, but it's definitely there. And so this project works to highlight um, this rich and overlooked facet of uh, theater history. The project is fully bilingual um, and, uh, sorry, um, and is very much anchored in both the fields of Quebecois theater and in Shakespeare studies, specifically the growing interest in global Shakespeare. So looking at um, how Shakespeare's cultural capital influences adaptations, translations, and performances of his work um, in different geotemporal contexts. As Quebecois adaptations, these plays all bear witness to a post-colonial or to post-colonial marginal subjectivities united uh, by the plurality, plurality of identity positions that they foreground. So of these approximately uh, 40 plays, only 12 plays in the corpus are available in print. Um, and of these 12 plays, none exists in a critical edition that comprehensively annotates both the Shakespearean sources as well as the Quebecois historical, political, cultural um, illusions, uh, which is what we aim to do. Um, several of the manuscripts that we have um, are draft scripts um, intended for stage production rather than publication. Many of them have marginal notes and underlinings by the author or the director, maybe, we don't know, or maybe the author and the director. Um, all my medieval paleography skills are coming in very handy. Um, there and uh, yeah, so the texts are, are um, both culturally and textually uh, layered and this is very much reflected um, in the editions um, that we'll be putting on this platform. So in these editions, um, all the Shakespearean references um, are annotated, um, historical and political allusions as well, annotated and explained. Um, the editions are going to be accompanied by a searchable database um, of each play's theater history um, and links to archival materials such as performance reviews, theater programs, and various visual media um, that we have for the individual plays. Um, and a timeline um, is also there situating the plays um, in relationship to each other and also in relation to kind of major milestones. Um, in theatrical, political, and cultural history of Quebec. Um, do I have another picture? No. No, that's it? No more picture? Okay, I'll go back. You can, you can look at the pictures. Um, so just some concluding thoughts. Um, the team is very much also committed uh, to developing the next generation of digital scholars. Um, all of the projects involve graduate students as research assistants, um, and all of the and, and many of our PhD students are preparing their own critical editions or are focusing on theoretical ideas related to digital editing. Um, all of our students, the PhD students are co-supervised, which I think is really important, um, which enables them to be fully supported, multiple perspectives, and I think it also helps them to gain a, a deeper connection um, to the team so they really know what's going on um, and feel involved. Um, along with shared knowledge and expertise within the researchers involved in the project, we're also aiming to develop some best practice guides um, in which we'll offer an operational summary of our recommended editorial protocols and models. Um, these guides are ideally intended to um, become reference points for researchers um, available in open access, the multimedia content, uh, specifically video tutorials. Um, that will explain the use of certain specific tools, methods, and methodologies 
uh, which reflect the group's research program and our collective expertise. Uh, so thinking of things related to um, document model and ontology, documentation, tagging, text mining, um, and visualization. Um, our team has adopted a flexible structure that allows continuous dialogue and direct collaboration between all researchers and partners. Our annual meetings in Montreal serve to define the particular needs of each project, to exchange knowledge, and to troubleshoot um, and offer support. Um, we've made a lot of progress. Michael said this has been going for about a decade now. Um, and he's told me to tell you that we are more grant applications. If anyone knows Michael, he is the king of grant applications, and we are eternally grateful to him for that. Um, we'll be applying for more grants in the fall, and we are open to new partners and partnerships. So if anyone wants to get more involved with us, um, come, and, come and speak to us at some point. So that's it. Thank you.